Uh, right. Uh, good morning, sir. Your uh, mic is unmuted. If you could mute it for a moment, we, we are going to be beginning shortly. Uh, sir, can you hear me? I can, yes. Uh, sir, if you could uh, turn off your screen sharing for a moment, uh, we are going to be introducing uh, the talk first, and uh, then we'll uh, hand over the presenting to you. All right, this is just a slide to show before we start. Uh, sure, I think, okay, okay, we can use that. We we're actually going to show your uh, picture, act actually, uh, so people could be acquainted to you better. All of them were hearing you today. Abdullah, if you could kindly share the slides. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. GCU ACM student chapter extends a warm welcome to all of you on this ACM distinguished talk titled of machines and men. Uh, sir, if you uh, could kindly uh, mute your mic for a moment. <clears throat> now, let me give you a short introduction of what this talk is going to be about. Continuing improvements in computing technology are allowing machines to perform in ways that model human activity to the extent that many people now treat machines as if they were people. There is discussion of human rights, moral machines, and even spiritual machines. Why is this? What is it about humans? This causes them to endow mechanical artifacts with personhood. Why indeed is there often an assumption that the machines will be malicious and turn on their human creators? The stock will be presenting some of the technology that allows machine to simulate human behavior and identify the clear distinct distinctions that can still be drawn between machines and people. Our ACM distinguished speaker for this talk is going to be Professor Peter Robinson. Peter Robinson is a professor of computing technology in computer laboratory at the University of Cambridge in England, where he leads work on computer interactions. He's also a fellow of Gonville and Caius College, where he pre previously studied for a first degree in mathematics and a PhD in computer science under Neil Weisman. He's also a chartered engineer, a fellow of British Computer Society, and a member of Association for Computing Machinery. Ladies and gentlemen, with great honor, let me please welcome Professor Peter Robinson. Well, thank you very much for your kind invitation and uh, introduction. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure to be with you this morning. <clears throat> and uh, 
uh, or morning here, afternoon for you, I think. Uh, and I'm hoping that in our, our uh, time together now, we can spend a little while thinking about uh, what it means to be human in a time when machines are becoming increasingly human-like. And some people are very worried about this. Uh, they see this new world of machines as being quite frightening. Uh, we see newspaper headlines like this, uh, that uh, uh, robots are going to take over the world. They're going to turn on us. They'll become uh, the next generation. Maybe we're going to evolve into robots. And uh, some uh, quite clever people are clearly very worried about this. And what I'd like to explain this morning is a little bit about uh, why I've come to think about robots and why I think a lot of these fears are misplaced. And there are things to be worried about, no doubt about it. But um, I'm not sure that uh, scaremongering about robots is really the problem. So uh, let's go back and, and think. I mean, one of the... Uh, the suggestions is indeed that, that robots will somehow evolve into human, or humans will evolve into a, a new form. So, of course, we uh, understand that we've evolved and um, we've become uh, uh, better as, as people. And some people think that maybe we're going to evolve further, that we'll actually uh, turn into robots. And, of course, there are people who have little artificial bits added on to them. They talk about transhumanism, humans that uh, merge into robots. And um, Ray Kurzweil, the, the famous inventor, invented optical character recognition, now is a, a futurologist for Google, believes that there are people alive today who will never die that technology is increasing their life expectancy by more than one year every year. Well, why does this interest a computer technologist? Uh, I, I don't actually um, think that this is that likely to happen. I don't even think it would be a good thing if people lived forever. Um, and that takes us back into thinking about, well, what does it mean to be human? Why do we care about being human? Now, some years ago, 20 years ago or so, I became interested in questions to do with uh, communication between people and machines. And when people talk to each other, we don't just listen to what the person's saying, but we look at their faces. It's one of the things that makes uh, video conferencing so difficult. We can't see faces. Well, we look at faces, we listen to the tone of voice as well as the actual words being said. We look at body posture and gesture and we use those to form an understanding of what the person listening is thinking about. Now of course I can't see you so I don't know whether you're bored or interested, confused or understanding. But if I were there in person I'd be able to see that and if you're lucky I'd change the way I was making the presentation accordingly. And it's an important part of social communication, but people who can't read these social signals, particularly facial expressions, have a difficulty in communicating. It's people with what we call autism spectrum conditions. And in that sense, computers are autistic. They don't understand these signals. And we thought it'd be interesting to see if we could make computer systems that did uh, understand social signals. And so we looked back into this uh, history and we saw that uh, a lot of the early work was actually done by Charles Darwin here in Cambridge. Uh, Darwin collaborated with a man called Guillaume Duchesne de Boulogne in Paris and Boulogne had been interested in studying facial expressions. And Darwin, just after he published his book on the evil, evolution of species, uh, the origin of species, um, became interested in wondering if there was a common language in the face, because that would give an evolutionary advantage. So it would support his theory. 
Now, Duchenne had been taking the photographs of people showing different facial expressions, and Darwin had a set of these photographs. They're, they're big photographs, they're like a large sheet of paper. Uh, and of course, photographs in the 1870s were um, a very valuable commodity. These were expensive to make. And Duchenne gave Darwin a set, which was very valuable, um, and Darwin used it in his experiments. In fact, uh, we still have Darwin's set of photographs in our library here in the university in Cambridge. You can actually go and see them, and they're rather wonderful. So what Darwin did was try to see if when he showed people these photographs, they saw the same expression, they understood the same emotion in the pictures. And uh, here you see 10 of the pictures from Darwin's set of pictures. We had these scanned and digitized. We uh, put them on the internet. And what, um, what Darwin did was he actually showed people the pictures and asked them what they saw and put the results in a spreadsheet. You can see the spreadsheets on the left there. They're just big sheets of paper with uh, uh, rows for the different pictures and columns for the different people looking at them, and he saw that there was a consistent view about what the pictures showed. So we repeated this with the pictures online, rather than having a dozen or so participants that Darwin had, we had about 20,000, and we found that, uh, yes, people saw consistently the same expressions in the pictures, um, and in fact, they were pretty much the same as they had been 130 years earlier. And that was quite interesting. Uh, it meant that these facial expressions were fairly universal and people still understood them the same way uh, 120 years on. And um, it's not surprising, actually, if you think about it, there is a language in the face. It's a way that we communicate with each other and we show social and emotional uh, feelings through our faces. And when we see these in other people, we adapt accordingly. It's all part of the way we conduct our conversation. But then we also, the person may show a facial expression to show empathy with what I'm saying, or I might show a facial expression to acknowledge what somebody else does. And there are two different kinds of mental state that might be portrayed here. One are basic emotions, and these are essentially the things that Darwin studied. There are about half a dozen of them, and they're very uh, physical, visceral emotions that are important for survival. Uh, so they're things like anger and disgust. And um, there are also complex mental states, ones that relate to what you're thinking, things like understanding and confused. Well, Darwin only studied the, the basic emotions. Um, and he, uh, uh, his work was repeated in the 1960s, a bit more scientifically, by a Californian psychologist, Paul Ekman, who identified these six basic emotions um, that are uh, the ones that are important for survival. So anger, disgust, fear, joy, sadness, surprise. And they're... Uh, uh, universal, they're shared across different cultures uh, around the world. They're even, uh, to some extent, recognized by people who've been separated from uh, modern day Western culture. They still interpret these facial expressions the same way. So they really are part of our genetic makeup. But they're a limited language. They're quite extreme. We are not often genuinely angry about something. Um, and for computer communication purposes, uh, there are some more subtle emotions that are more interesting. These are the uh, complex mental states, the things like one, like understanding, confused, interested, bored. And my colleague in Cambridge, Simon Baron Cohen, who runs the Autism Research Centre here, uh, developed a taxonomy, a, a language of emotions by taking all the emotion words in a dictionary, and about 1,200 of them, and then working out which ones were 
synonyms meant the same as each other and which ones were different. And he worked it down to uh, um, about 400 emotion concepts, very finely graduated, and grouped these into, <coughs> excuse me, into uh, 24 broad groups. And six of those groups were the basic emotions that Darwin had studied. And the other um, 24, uh, other 18 of the 24 were these complex mental states. And they're the ones that we probably need to understand for computers. You, you can, it turns out you can understand basic emotions from still pictures, but the complex mental states often require a couple of seconds of moving video evidence in order to interpret them. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, there are other ways you can work with these. Another psychologist, um, uh, Jim Russell, took these words and got people to spread them out on a table with words with similar emotions together and ones with disparate emotions further apart. It's a bit like doing a, a principal component analysis on the emotions. And what he came up with was a picture that looks a bit like this. And actually what you see there is the words have separated into different axes. There's a horizontal axis that uh, goes from negative emotions to positive emotions, from things like depression and gloomy up to content and satisfied and happy. And that we call valence. And there's a vertical axis, <coughs> which is to do with um, arousal from passive at the bottom, sleepy, bored, up to the very active at the top, which could be active and positive, like excited, or it could be active and negative, like alarmed. And that means we can actually use numbers to describe how these emotions are, um, uh, are portrayed. Well, we've now got a, a, a way of classifying emotions, either using uh, categorical labels, the, the, the categories that <coughs> Simon Baron Cohen invented, or using these dimensional analysis from Jim Russell. And uh, so we built a computer system uh, or a series of systems over a number of years that uh, use computer vision and machine learning to recognize these. So uh, here you see one of my research students, Tadus Baltrositis, who wrote this system. He's mimicking various facial expressions and what you see is um, a color picture showing what the camera is showing uh, you see uh, we've identified where the head is where the face is in that and normalized it that's the little square at the bottom um, there's then some histograms of oriented gradients that we're using to uh, um, process the texture and what you then see uh, are little bar graphs which are showing actions, roughly speaking, corresponding to different muscle groups in the face activating. So there are bars for things like brows raising, lips pulling out and so on. And uh, as he animates his face, we see these muscles um, being recognized that these muscles are activating. Then you see a graph which is like the uh, valence arousal graph that you uh, saw in the previous picture and we can see as he changes his expression we're picking different points in that two-dimensional space and we're also getting the uh, um, uh, categorical labels from Simon Baron Cohen's taxonomy so that I mean we, we this is a very large and complicated system but it runs in real time on a laptop it's the sort of thing that you could run to process uh, facial expressions in real time. And that was uh, an interesting project. Uh, it took uh, several research students several years to build it, but it's, it's rather good. And we wondered which are the better classifications to use. If we're trying to recognize emotions, do we want to pick one of these two dozen categories or do we want to show the coordinates? Well, it turns out that the coordinates are um, indicative but not really very good for making decisions and we did an analysis that showed that if you uh, worked out the variability in 
recognizing emotions, um, actually, in the two-dimensional space, they don't separate very well. You'll see that uh, uh, of this, these, these, this just shows just the six basic emotions, which are the ones that are meant to be easy to tell apart. And we have on the uh, very positive side of the valence axis, happy, which is fairly active, but very positive valence. Uh, we've got um, surprise, which is the larger one that's mostly a positive valence that can be active or passive. But then the, the four negative uh, emotions overlap, fear, anger, disgust and sadness all substantially overlap. And the system isn't really distinguishing them very well. Um, so maybe the two dimensional representation isn't so good or maybe processing video of a face isn't the way to separate those and what we're actually seeing here is that video is quite good at identifying the valence from negative to positive but maybe not so good at recognizing the arousal level from passive to active and that's quite an interesting result. And one of the research students who had worked on this uh, thought it was a sufficiently good idea that she went off and set up a, a company called Affectiva, which actually sells this technology. And it has a variety of uses. Uh, initially, they used it to monitor uh, audiences being shown test versions of television commercials and then monitor the audience and see whether they were uh, uh, responding positively or negatively to the commercials. Um, but more recently, the work's been used to monitor car drivers. Uh, driving a car is increasingly a complex business. There are more computer assistants in the car. Traffic is busy on the roads. You've got all sorts of technology interrupting you from the car. And actually monitoring the driver's face to make sure that they're uh, in a good frame of mind is helpful. And if you're driving through an unfamiliar city centre, uh, you're lost, you're late for a meeting, there's a lot of traffic. The last thing you want is the car saying that you need to change the oil in a thousand kilometres time. The car should see that you are confused and concentrating and remove distractions. So certainly not tell you about things that aren't immediate. Um, it could do useful things though, like stopping your mobile phone from ringing or turning off the radio, or even letting you drive in the wrong direction for a bit uh, until you recover your composure. And then it could bring you back in to, uh, to, to the right destination. So her company has been monitoring passengers in cars to understand the interactions and the feelings of the drivers and that's actually proving very successful as a technology. Um, another thing that we did was in fact in conjunction with the Autism Research Centre in Cambridge was to develop a tool for teaching people with autism spectrum conditions about emotions. A lot of the people who are, have high functioning autism, Asperger's syndrome, are actually uh, very intelligent they know that they have a problem recognizing emotions and they want to do something about it. And so we built a system where they could learn about emotions by imitating them. So they would be shown a video of emotion and then act it out, uh, acting out in the facial expressions, in the tone of voice and in the body posture and gesture. And we had a series of systems that monitored these different channels and gave feedback. Uh, and our group worked on the facial expression side. So um, the uh, uh, you see here uh, the lady with the yellow shirt is acting an emotion. Uh, the person in picture number two is trying to replicate it. And then we get various diagnostic pictures that show which ways the uh, the 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 person emulating the emotion is succeeding and failing and, and says which bits of the face have to change. They can then learn about that and that will also help them learn how to recognize those emotions. And that's actually now available as a commercial system as well. So that was quite interesting. Um, it turns out that we can analyze people's faces and 
understand their mental states. And that's uh, a, a useful result. Well, when Darwin wrote his book back in 1872, he also, uh, in fact, the full title was on the expression of the emotions in man and animals. He was interested in animals. And in his book, he shows pictures of um, uh, both a dog and a cat who are prepared to fight at the top, the arched back, the fur raised, and in an affectionate frame of mind. So uh, a dog that's looking more cheerful and a cat that's looking more cheerful at the bottom. And these are uh, well, rather lovely expressions, of course, but also uh, it just shows that a lot of animals actually have ways of expressing emotions, in this case through their body posture and gesture, but Darwin also looked at horses, uh, which have quite expressive faces. And we thought it'd be interesting to see if our technology could help recognize animals' mental states as well. Well, now, we didn't have any horses available, but our department is next door to a veterinary school, and they've been working with sheep. And it turns out that sheep have very expressive faces. Uh, in particular, they use their faces to express levels of pain. Um, and sheep are quite often in pain. They wander around on hillsides in wet fields. They get uh, disease in their feet, and that causes them pain. So a, a happy sheep has uh, its eyes open, uh, its uh, cheeks puffed out, its ears up straight, its lips uh, uh, in a gentle shape, and its uh, nostrils in a U shape. And if it feels pain, the eyes close, the cheeks draw in, the ears sort of fold down, the lips are drawn back, and the nostrils move into a rather sharper V shape. And um, we actually managed to put together a, <clears throat> a system that could recognize sheep faces and then um, analyze them and estimate the pain. And here you see an example. We've taken a photograph of a flock of 20 or so sheep and, and, and identified where all the heads are uh, and then picked out particular sheep. And for them, we can see uh, the picture on the left shows a a healthy sheep, its ears are up, its eyes are open, uh, its nostrils are U-shaped. And on the uh, right-hand side, we have a, a sheep that's in moderate pain. Uh, its ears are beginning to fold down, its eyes are closing, and its nostrils are beginning to sh change into that V-shape. And in fact, in this flock of 20 sheep, you probably can't see it on this picture, but there are two that, of the sheep that have got red boxes drawn around them, which is our way of saying they're in moderate pain. And that actually turned out to be correct. It was those two that actually had problems with their feet. So there is actually some, some value in this, and we could automatically monitor sheep on a hillside by just putting cameras near where they go to feed, monitor them, read the radio tags that they have, and identify which sheep need to be treated to keep them healthy. This could be quite important for animal welfare. Well, back with the humans, um, we realized that we could, to some extent, understand the people's facial expressions, but we wondered maybe if the computer had a facial expression, people would enjoy talking to it more. And so we uh, looked into the possibility of making computers that expressed their emotional state through facial expressions using a, some sort of robot. Well, that's um, uh, uh, an interesting question. Of course, if you look at the, the sort of robots that people use for this, uh, this is a very popular robot called Now, and well, its face isn't really very expressive. In fact, it's just two light emitting diodes for the eyes and a black dot for the nose. You can't really express much with that. And so it's it's not really going to be terribly useful. So we look to see what other sorts of robot we could make. And um, well, buy ideally. And the, um, the obvious one was a toy for children that is um, an animated monkey. Uh, and this, this uh, uh, puppet has six motors inside its head, 
which we could actually use to uh, animate it. And we got people to have a conversation with it and either uh, animated the face randomly or made it copy what the person speaking to it was doing with their face uh, to the extent that we could with the limited number of motors. And people actually thought it was paying attention if it copied their facial expressions. Now, obviously, it wasn't a person. Uh, obviously, a, it had a, a no empathy whatsoever, but they sensed that it was being empathic if it replicated their motions. We thought, well, that's really interesting. We wondered then, well, how realistic does the robot have to be for people to feel that? And so we did an experiment where we got video clips of various sorts of robot uh, suffering at the hands of people. So we went from a robotic vacuum cleaner uh, through um, a desk lamp that has an eye, uh, uh, looks a bit like an eye, and people uh, think eyes are quite important for, for emotional expression, through a various realism of people up to a natural human. And people felt more empathy the more human like the character in the film looks so uh, they might care about the robot vacuum cleaner being stamped on but they cared much more about a real human being stamped on and so we thought well that's interesting we should make a robot that looks very like a human and so we uh, commissioned a, um, a, a robot from a man called uh, David Hansen in America and this has a prosthetic head with something like 30 motors inside it, replicating the muscles in the face. Uh, and they're all buried inside the head. It's got this really good prosthetics. So the skin texture is very realistic. Uh, we give it a wig, uh, dress it up, and it looks really remarkably realistic. And uh, uh, by activating these motors, um, we can give quite good demonstrations of different fa uh, different emotions, different facial expressions. And if you look at those pictures, it really does look very convincing and dressed up. People find it really rather interesting. Um, and, uh, so we started doing experiments with this to see if people would enjoy having a conversation with the computer when the computer was being portrayed through a robot. And um, one of the experiments we did was uh, in a driving simulator where we thought what we could do is in our driving simulator, have the robot sitting next to you and acting as if it were a satellite navigation system. So it would actually have a conversation with you and show empathy. Well, this is a, a slightly silly, demonstration we just did this for fun because of course you couldn't see its face so the fact that it had an expressive face was neither here nor there um, and actually it turned out that this robot was of really very limited value for scientific work because most people found that the robot was just uh, creepy uh, it turns out that although we could replicate the motors quite accurately. We couldn't, the still expressions were very good, but the moving faces were not so good. People are very good at recognizing when there's something wrong uh, with the movement in a face, and they just found him creepy to talk to. Um, the motors essentially, partly it was mechanical problems, it just jittered, and partly it was just it's very hard to get the smooth motion that looks natural. So this robot turned out to be a really rather limited uh, scientific value. Um, it was very expensive and it didn't really work. The one thing we did do with it was actually some work with medical students at the local hospital. And there is a condition, a medical condition called dystonia, where people's faces have the muscles just move uncontrollably. It's very disconcerting 
when you meet a patient with dystonia. And medical students who are training, when they first meet one of these patients, are quite likely to show disgust in their faces as they see this strange movement in the patient's face. And that's a bad idea for a medical student. And we thought, oh, well, we could program our robot to emulate these. So in fact, we got a, a, a man with dystonia who came in and we filmed him and then we replayed his uh, facial expressions on the robot and our robot's quite good at random movements. And we found then that when we uh, took a group of medical students and showed some of them, uh, uh, had some of them interact with the robot, they were then better able to control their own expressions when they met a real patient. So that was verging on a, a, a useful result, um, except it also turned out if you showed them videos of the patient, that worked as well. So that wasn't terribly useful. And in fact, it turns out that the robot's real use well, if you have a robot with facial expressions, it turns out it, the press get very excited. And so we got endless visits from television companies that wanted to film our robot. Um, and we even got to uh, appear uh, in this video clip on uh, live national television in Spain. Uh, this is a, a show that goes out every night, popular show. And we programmed the robot to essentially copy um, whatever I was doing. So point a camera at my face and the robot just copies it. And um, uh, actually, this a very risky thing to do. We quite like doing demonstrations in our group, but doing a demonstration of an experimental face tracker, uh, an unreliable robot on live television was perhaps a little rash, but we didn't think the audience would be that big. And here you see a modified version of our face tracker that's just being used to control the robot. And in fact, the um, uh, the presenter of the show, who turns out to be a very intelligent man, I mean, he's obviously very good at popular television, but he, in a couple of minutes rehearsal in the afternoon, worked out uh, which facial expressions would work well on the robot. And so he did very slow, very deliberate movements, and it looked terrifically convincing. Uh, and it was a huge success. So that was quite interesting. It meant that the um, uh, the robot wasn't much used scientifically, but um, somehow uh, people really empathized with it. They thought it was a very interesting thing. And that's true. People have always been interested in making mechanical people. Uh, and this actually goes back a long way. Uh, if we uh, go back to the 16th century, uh, this um, is a, a mechanical monk that was uh, made um, in the 16th century. And uh, every part of the body has actions and it moves forwards and backwards, the head turns left and right, the eyes look towards the, the hand when it's raised, um, and so on. Uh, but in fact, this goes back even further. The, the, there's, uh, this was a, a clockwork model, but the much earlier um, myths of the, uh, the precious metal people that wept when the Buddha Shakyamuni died in the 5th century BC, uh, and so on. So there are lots of histories of people being wanting to make humanoid automata. And actually, many of these then turn out to be um, hostile. Uh, there are many stories of people making uh, humanoid machines and the machines then turn on them. And this goes back to the Jewish golem mythologies of the, uh, again, the 16th century, the, the Frankenstein stories uh, of the early 19th century. And even to the 20th century, uh, uh, a very intelligent play by the, the Czech uh, playwright Karol Čapek called Rossum's Universal Robots. Actually, an interesting play it introduced the word robot to mean a, a humanoid. And uh, in the play, the robots were designed as servants, but they became sentient and turned on their masters. 
uh, interestingly, a recurrent theme in uh, in the science fiction literature. And of course, the same things happened in more recent science fiction. Um, also in the 1920s, there was uh, the film Metropolis, um, and then later and into the 20th, uh, later 20th century, things like the Asimov robot stories, uh, and famously Kubrick's 2001. So there's a, a long history of robots in fiction, which tend to look like people. The, the robot in 2001 controlling the spaceship is, is of course, very different from, from that. It just is a, essentially a red light. Uh, but um, that's because Kubrick was a good filmmaker. But usually they look like humans. They become sentient. They turn on their own. So it's a standard story throughout uh, uh, history. And it just repeats lots of times. But that's very curious, actually, because really most robots don't look like people. <coughs> most robots are actually doing things like manufacturing, making cars. They're um, doing, in that case, heavy work that involves uh, um, uh, moving big bits of metal. It's actually quite dangerous for people to be close. Uh, and these robots do it. Uh, without hurting people, they do it uh, more accurately, uh, and they don't get bored. So they're actually rather a good way of uh, running a factory. And the same is true, of, to some extent, of making integrated circuits. Uh, integrated circuits are now so delicate and have to be kept in such clean conditions, you don't want to let human beings uh, near them when they're being made. And so they're made almost entirely by robotic processes. They're the only things that can work to that precision and in absolutely clean conditions so as not to contaminate the integrated circuits. And of course, even in medicine, um, uh, there are now robots in operating theatres, usually remotely controlled, but they have a steadier hand than a real surgeon. And that has to be uh, of some interest as well. So, uh, it would seem that uh, the real robots are out there uh, doing everyday things. There's no possibility of them. They don't look like humans. They won't become sentient. They're not going to turn on us. These are the real robots, uh, and they're doing an important job. But in fact, there are other robots around us as well. And uh, a, a very perceptive article by uh, Vince Cerf, the American who sort of invented the internet, observes that anything that takes input and produces output and has a perceptible effect on the world could be construed as a, a robot. So things like mobile phones, uh, satellite navigation systems, automatic trading systems for stock exchanges and currency. These are the real robots, and we don't even see them. They're just sort of buried in the world around us. We use the mobile phones, but we don't think about what they're doing to affect our lives. We rely on satellite navigation and um, can have quite surprising effects when it stops working. And automatic trading uh, actually performs transactions in less than a thousandth of a second, so much faster than a person could even understand what was happening to a price of a commodity or a stock or share or currency, uh, and makes trades. And mistakes in those systems can have a dramatic effect on the world. Um, when uh, uh, faults creep into the, the telephone system and our mobile phones all stop working, we're in difficulty. If our satellite navigation doesn't work, we're in difficulty. If stock market systems trade uh, out of control, arguably that was one of the things that led to the stock market uh, crash back in 2008, was automatic trading systems that had a, 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 a positive feedback loop that wasn't understood by its designers. So these robots don't look like people. They're not even visible, but they're actually really quite a serious concern. And of course, the military um, love robots as well. Uh, and some of these are 
uh, again, just remotely controlled devices like the machines are used to go and uh, dispose of bombs. But increasingly, the military are becoming interested in having autonomous robots that work on the battlefield or possibly even uh, remote from the uh, battlefield. So the sort of drones that uh, launch missile attacks and are controlled by people sitting in a comfortable bunker several thousand miles away. And there's increasing talk about weapon systems that would be autonomous, so they'd have their own control systems. Now, um, I don't think I'm terribly worried about these becoming sentient and turning on their owners, but I'm very worried about the competence of the people making them. And yet we don't really seem to worry about these much. What we worry about are, or we think about, are trivial things like domestic robots. So the sort of vacuum cleaners that go around the house or cut the grass outside. Um, and in some cultures, particularly Japanese culture, I should say, um, they're, they're fascinated by the idea of having robots as, uh, well, waiters in cafes, running a hotel, and even um, in the third picture there, a robot that is uh, conducting a wedding. Um, and these are just glorified toys. <clears throat> uh, so they're, they're, they're not going to pose any problems, but they say something very curious about the human mind, that we, we want to relate to these machines. And it brings us back to the question of, well, will some people evolve into machines and uh, uh, there are some who think that this idea transhumanism the sort of uh, uh, bridging the gap between people and humans is important so uh, Steve Mann uh, when he was at MIT put a, a lot of effort into making body-worn camera systems and he lived in a virtual world uh, inside his headset with a camera showing him what was going on in the real world uh, to see if this augmented his intelligence. The computer system could <clears throat> recognize things around him and flash up messages on a screen that he's got in his headset. Um, I think most people just thought he was a bit weird, actually. Some people think that we'd be able to artificially enhance our memories by plugging in extra memory chips or maybe even save all our memories and somehow put that into a new body and uh, reincarnate ourselves. Seems a bit unlikely. <clears throat> There's uh, also the picture there uh, of a um, an English scientist, Kevin Warwick, and his wife, Arena. And what they have done, what Kevin Warwick did, was implant sensors in his arm that recognize muscle movement. And in this case, he's actually put one of those uh, in the arm of his wife, and he has transducers attached to his arm that stimulate the muscle. So as his wife moves her arm in some way, his hand moves uncontrollably the same way. Well, <clears throat> of course, that's not something you'd want in practice, but it's just to demonstrate that actually this could be of some use for people who have paralysis. So these are perhaps verging on the, the useful. You could imagine that someone who's paralyzed but has some signaling in the neural system could use that to control mechanical assistance. And there are reasons to believe that's going to be useful. And in fact, these aren't really transhuman people. They're just people with a bit of uh, mechanical and electronic assistance. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and the, the real transhumans are people who've got prosthetic limbs, maybe even with neural control, hearing aids, heart pacemakers, all of these sorts of things. And these people aren't evolving. There's no genome that they're going to pass on to their descendants. It's just a bit of mechanical assistance, like a telephone lets us communicate more quickly. This just lets someone hear better or keeps their heart going uh, more reliably. So this rather brings us to the question of, well, what's artificial intelligence? Uh, back with the question I posed at the beginning, should we be worried about artificial intelligence, uh, robots, <clears throat> sentient systems? 
well, I think I've, I hope I've explained that robots uh, in the sense of things that look like people is perhaps misleading. Uh, they're very good in science fiction, but they're not really the problem. But there are problems, perhaps, with artificial intelligence. And uh, of course, this means different things to different people. I guess the the popular meaning of uh, artificial intelligence, well, probably the main use is marketing. If you're trying to sell a product, you say it's got artificial intelligence and people think this is a good thing. Alternatively, it's used for scaremongering, so to frighten people, a bit like the quotations I showed at the beginning. Artificial intelligence is going to uh, take over the world. Probably a better definition of artificial intelligence, at least for a computer scientist, is it's something that we don't know how to do it yet. Uh, and so once we know how to do it, we give it a real name like uh, image understanding, facial expression analysis, language translation, uh, protein folding. Uh, fraud detection for credit card. So artificial intelligence is sort of a buzz phrase for no real meaning. <clears throat> and the technical definition is perhaps, well, it's when a machine tries to perform a cognitive process that's uh, a bit like a person. And this often relies on machine learning, of course. And how does machine learning work? Well, you collect a large body of data you use a statistical analysis to understand some sort of underlying mathematical model, and then you use the model to predict the responses to unseen inputs. And of course, this has been enormously successful for things like uh, self-driving cars. You train them to recognize lots of different road scenes and what to do. Unfortunately, uh, the people who train them don't have a lot of video of, um, uh, of cyclists, um, <clears throat> of unicyclists, of people with bicycles with trailers, and a lot of the accidents that happen is because the training didn't involve understanding the real variety of road conditions. Um, another major use of uh, this sort of machine learning is, of course, in the commercial systems of people like Facebook. Uh, Facebook are very interested in selling you advert advertising. That's what they want you to do is to watch, use Facebook more and more. Uh, and this is true of all the social media uh, so that you they can show you more and more advertisements. And every time you see an advertisement, they're charging somebody. And that means that they want you to use their system for a long time. So they're interested in engagement. How can they make you use it for longer? Because that way they can show you more commercials. And the answer is, well, by showing you more of what you like to see. And they're very good at building mathematical models of what you like to see and then showing you more of it. And that does indeed keep you watching. And they're also very good at identifying who your friends are. That's why they give you communication tools so they can identify your network of people. And they're likely to have similar uh, understandings. And so they can then draw them in and in engage more people in the system. So the whole thing cycles around engagement and recruiting more participants so they can show more advertisements, make more money. So, and Facebook are awfully good at that, uh, it has to be said, uh, as are all of the various social media. But it's, well, is it, is it artificial intelligence? Is it sentient? No, it's machine learning. It's a very specific pattern understanding. Uh, and of course, it has arguably unintended side effects. Um, if it, the system just shows you more and more of what you like seeing, it'll just um, promote your... Uh, prejudices. And if you're uh, of a, a, a particular political persuasion, it'll show you more and more evidence that, that other people think the same way, because that's what you want to watch. That's the way they can show you more advertisements. But perhaps another question is, can a machine think? And this was a question famously posed by the British uh, mathematician, Alan Turing, who 
dabbled in computer science in the early days. Um, and he, he posed the idea of a, a game where um, you have uh, uh, two people um, communicating uh, over text links and you try and determine uh, uh, who is whom, um, whether one's a person or one's a machine, um, by a conversation. And the sort of questions that he thought about were uh, things like doing arithmetic problems, which he thought a computer would be good at, playing chess, which he thought a computer probably wouldn't be as good at. And actually, that turned out to be wrong. Uh, chess was easily solved by a very fast computer without actually any intelligence. Or maybe composing poetry. Maybe that's something that's a human activity. And this would allow you to uh, uh, understand that the person was a human if they understood and appreciated poetry. And um, he, he didn't actually expect that a machine would pass this test for um, another 100 years, so till the 2050s, maybe. But it's interesting that Turing was probably somewhere on the autism spectrum. And in his work, he had no uh, thought given to facial expressions, tone of voice, body posture and gesture. In other words, he omitted all the emotional content of speech from this. It was really a rather naive test. And interestingly, when he first wrote this essay, he was working for a scientific organization in the UK um, whose director was um, Charles Darwin, not the Charles Darwin I spoke about earlier, but actually that Charles Darwin's grandson, who dismissed it as a schoolboy essay. Well, people like to think that Turing was a, a great man now, so um, they think this was a great essay. Actually, it probably was a, a schoolboy essay. And calling his essay, Can a Machine Think?, as Edgar Dijkstra, the, the uh, computer scientist, said, well, it depends on what you mean by machine and think. And that's actually uh, uh, a rather good question. And Dijkstra said it's, it's a silly question. It's like asking, can a submarine swim? Uh, it's just, uh, uh, if you like, a category error. It's the wrong sort of question to ask. And, and people do think that machines uh, are becoming like people, and people are becoming like machines. And it's uh, it's very curious. They sort of think that this is, uh, we have this fascination with robots that's not real. Not real. Um, these computer systems aren't sentient. They're they're simulations. It's an inability to distinguish uh, the real thing from a simulation, and we don't have a relationship uh, with these machines. Relationships are what make, make people human. Uh, we actually relate with each other uh, and we use emotional expression as part of that. And machines don't have that. So machines are, may simulate people and simulate them quite well, albeit the physical relation, physical representation is not particularly good. There's no relationship. They might uh, recognize and display emotions, but they don't actually have any empathy internally. And of course, they're completely non-spiritual. And they're really what this underpins, this confusion in people is a, uh, a, a, a misunderstanding of the psychology. It's, it's what um, uh, philosophers would call a category error. Uh, we have these theories of uh, uh, modernism where we try to explain people as if they were intelligent machines. And this sort of goes back a long way in the Enlightenment. We thought that science could explain everything, but it couldn't. Uh, then in the Industrial Revolution, we started to think of people as machines. And, and in the 19th century, it was very popular to talk about people as machines with functional parts, a bit like a giant steam engine. And now in the 20th century, in the computer age, well, people are computers. Their thought processes are uh, computational. What we're trying to do in that modernist view is reduce people to the mechanical and whatever the 
popular technology of the day is, that's what we use to explain people. And the other side of that is anthropomorphism. Uh, we see machines as if they were human. We impose humanity on the machines. And both of these are, are mistaken views. Um, we can't use science or technology to explain all of the human experience. And we can't push the human experience into machines. Neither of these work. So uh, it's important to remember that machines are a simulation and people are the real thing. And of course, there are ethical implications for this. If we worry about uh, these things, what do we worry about? Well, I, I guess the, the, the really key thing is to remember that robots are not people. And we've got sensor systems and servers that control things. In Vincer's words, uh, robots or anything that's going to monitor the world and have an effect on it. But that's not the same as being sentient. And so we've got to remember that these are simulations, not an, a new evolution. And if we pretend that the machines are people, it's just a category error. It's, it's the can a submarine swim question. But there are very important ethical issues. Uh, and we've seen some of those in some of the robot systems. I talked about Facebook and I talked about stock market trading. And arguably, these are two things that have had uh, uh, serious effects in the world. And they're actually the, the robot systems that worry me. Um, and one is the competence. And the, the, the things we worry about are the competence of the people implementing them. And if you think about it, uh, with the stock market trading, the people were not competent. They didn't understand feedback loops in rapid systems uh, with, with positive feedback. And so that was a, an error of competence. And in Facebook, unfortunately, they're really rather competent, but you might question their motivation. Their motivation is to make money. And if that's at the expense of the human experience, they're not so worried. But actually, those are precisely the two areas in which professions are qualified. Professions, and this is all professions, doctors, accountants, computer scientists, they're well paid because they've been educated and so they're competent and they have a responsibility. And the responsibility isn't just to make money. And so we should always be asking ourselves, are the, of any technology, are the people doing it competent? Or is it going to run out of control? And we might question that with some of the autonomous weapons. Are they competent? Hmm. Maybe not. Maybe they, they don't understand all the environment in which systems will work. And what is their motivation? Are they responsible? Um, and again, with the military, you might question that. With Facebook, you might question it. But that's just what it means to be a professional. And so I guess my message you all really is you're learning computer science and you're about to become professionals and the important thing for professionals is their competence which i'm sure you're being very well taught but your motivation and you have to have an understanding of a responsibility more than just to make a profit um, it's to serve mankind and with that uh, i'll stop i should just mention of course that I do very little of this. Uh, mostly it's a large team of <clears throat> uh, exceptionally clever students um, and postdocs who, who do all of this research work, who built all of these systems. I think there are two dozen people there of about 15 different nationalities. It's a great thing about uh, um, education is we're uh, a very diverse community um, and we uh, managed to do these, well, these students managed to do these really exciting things together um, while I just sit back and, and watch and have the pleasure of coming to talk to you. And I'd also very happily now take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, Doctor, for your um, arrival and for your this enlightened talk with the GCUS stem cell injector. We are very happy to have you with us. My question is, uh, you you talk about that we do not have relationship with the machines. So when I have my Facebook and I interact with the Facebook in so many different ways, ultimately Facebook show me some advertisement that are more relevant to me. Is it that it become my friend or is it it become my own like uh, thing? And if I go to suppose someone else's wall, it will not be my wall. I will feel some alien over there. So would machines have to have some personality over the years that are coming? In Yes. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I, I, I think the important point there is, no, it's not your friend. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it's a simulation. Uh, and so uh, if we think uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, the representation that you're seeing there, um, it is just uh, a, a, a lot of machine learning that knows what you like and shows you more of what you like and it, it's partly this this uh, uh thing that we we try and pretend that the machines are human so it's a very natural instinct um when i uh, um, uh get into the uh, uh my car um I talk to it, but it's not really understanding me. <clears throat> and um, or when I use uh, a, a voice recognition system like Alexa, um, if I get cross, I'll address it as a person. But I should never make the mistake of thinking that it actually is a person. Uh, it's just that it's um, uh, a simulation that it's quite entertaining to talk to in those terms. So. Uh, Yes, Facebook very much want you to think that it's your friend, um, that the um, uh, that the, what you're seeing there is your friends, and uh, but the the system itself is is just a a machine for making money. You are proposing that the idea of artificial intelligence is not possible uh, for the humans. We are. We can make machines that are intelligent, supposedly intelligent. They are simulating our behavior, but generally intelligent machines are not possible. Is that what? Ah, uh, well, that's um, uh, if if you like uh, this question. Um, I, I I I tried to draw this distinction that artificial intelligence um tends to be a phrase that's used by journalists and and. Um, and, and it's used by salespeople, uh, it's used to frighten us, uh, but actually for computer scientists, artificial intelligence isn't a very meaningful phrase. Uh, it maybe describes a problem that we haven't solved yet, um, but when we have solved it, we have a better name for it. So uh, even the people who are trying to sell artificial intelligence have realized now that talking about artificial intelligence isn't a very meaningful thing. So now they talk about artificial general intelligence, meaning um, that uh, uh, the machine will actually be able to think generally like a person. And they speculate as to how you might build such a machine. Um, you, you could put together all the components of the human brain and simulate it. But it would still be a simulation. It wouldn't be the real thing. So uh, uh, and, and there are the, the also the, they've also done calculations of the the energy that would be required to power um, such a device. Uh, and it's um, enormous, uh, vastly more than the power in the universe. So uh, it's unlikely to be a, uh, a major uh, factor if in, the, in the near future.
So extending your research of uh, facial recognition and the emotional recognition, if I would say I can build in some memory in the car and the car would understand my emotions over the time and there comes a time when it becomes the, the intelligent car like the people used to have horses in the back era and the horses were their, like their own uh, depiction of their own characters. So again, this is, you were saying it's, it's simulation, but aren't human the, human the simulation of some intelligent behaviors? Aren't we the machines? Um, I, I, sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. The, um, the car might um, uh, uh, recognize things and react accordingly. Uh, that's fine. Um, uh, but the car doesn't have any intelligence. I mean, when I walk up to a, um, a lift, an elevator, and the door is shutting, and I put my foot out to kick the sensor on the door so that it opens again. Um, the lift, the elevator doesn't feel pain. It has no sensations like that. Now you might sort of pretend that it does, but that is just a simulation. It's a pretense. Um, it's, it is, uh, when all said and done, a machine, uh, and people are different from machines. Thank you very much, Doctor. I, I am also a pragmatist. I believe that these are the simulations and artificial intelligence is helping us to improve the world and our tasks. So I am quite suspicious also about the artificial intelligence. Thank you very much for enforcing my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Well, I think that's, uh, that's, that's probably a wise view to be suspicious. Yes. Uh, and um, I, as, as I hinted the the real thing is to uh, uh, understand that these are there, there are problems here but they're just prof the standard professional issues the things that i described as um competence and motivation are the things that uh, really matter for uh, anyone working in this field uh, understand that and don't get confused by the uh, thinking of the machines as if they're people. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peter, for your wonderful discussion. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, as you said, that um, uh, the current machines do not possess uh, human-like intelligence, uh, as I was perceiving, perceiving from your discussion. So what do you think human intelligence is based upon? And uh, uh, I'm not talking about the current machines. Uh, do you think is there any possibility by any means or by any chance that uh, future machines can uh, possess the same uh, level of intelligence as uh, humans do? Um, my basic well, question no. is, sorry, my basic question is what what basically are the constructs of human intelligence? Well, that's a, a good question. I don't think I know the answer. I think if I knew the answer to that, I would be... Um, uh, uh, rather better off than I am. A lot of people are trying to work that out. Uh, it's true. Um, uh, perhaps another way of thinking about the question is what makes us human? Uh, and uh, certainly one, and I find this the most convincing explanation of what makes us human, um, is that uh, there is a creator God who made us and we're made in the image of God. And if you uh, think about this, what this means is that God was um, a creator uh, and a, a judge of the world. And so we're put into the world to serve in that way. And we're made for relationships, relationships with God. Um, and with each other. And a lot of what we see in the world is to do with relationships that are broken. Uh, and so uh, actually, what is it that makes us intelligent? Well, it's that, uh, that, uh, that, that genuine relationship with each other, with God, if you're theologically inclined, uh, as I am. And that's what distinguishes us from the machines. The machines don't have relationships. They have simulations of relationships uh, and I think that that 
is possibly the core of what is intelligence. It's not just collecting facts and processing them. It's actually uh, a deeper thing about what is it that makes us human uh, and what is it that makes us human. Actually, relationships is the answer. Uh, okay, uh, as I said, that uh, relationship is the answer. Uh, I think that uh, uh, might be the possibility that uh, we are not able to find or uh, to quest the relation machine might be having uh, with the God or the uh, greater consciousness. Is there any possibility for that? Um, I, well, uh, there you're, you're stepping into theological grounds and um, uh, the answer is uh, no, I don't think machines have those relationships either with other machines or with God. So that's why I actually see them as being a very different sort of thing. It's this category error again. Um, machines are machines and people are people and people are uh, made for relationships and machines are made to do particular functions. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, sir, I have a question. Uh, is my mic audible? Yes, yes, sir. You could talk. Sir, I want to take the uh, argument from an intelligence perspective to, let's say, a species perspective as a whole. Are we completely discounting the possibility that even, let's say, a metal species is possible? It doesn't have to be like human. It doesn't have to be imitating us. It just has to be a new biological entity on its own, like we have animals, like we have birds. Do you think they could be something like that? Is there a possibility of something like that in the future? They don't have to possess human-like intelligence, but they have their own separate processes or whatever. And the evolution into something that could be categorized as their own species, a metal species. Um, well, of course, uh, new species uh, evolve all the time. Uh, ev evolution is a continuing process, uh, so we uh, see that even now that uh, new species are evolving in response to changes in the environment. So yes, I have no doubt that new species will um, emerge, um, but the uh, the process of um, Evolution is essentially a biological process, so uh, machines aren't going to be involved in that. They don't have um, uh, the possibility for uh, the DNA to um, uh, uh, give them that sort of genetic variation. But the, but biologically, yes, new species arrive all the time, um, and, and that's actually another very clear way in which humans are different from machines. The machines are essentially uh, identical to each other, whereas the humans are subtly different. So I have one more, just another question. Mm -hmm. uh, I follow Dr. Stephen Hawking a lot, and uh, he once said that we should be uh, fearful of machines uh, progressing at the rate at the, as they are right now and they would take off on their own and redesign themselves at an ever increasing rate. What do we have to say about uh, that? He was an inc incredibly intelligent person. What do we have to say about that statement of his? And yeah, sorry, think, uh, uh, could you just tell me the name again that you were talking about? Dr. Stephen Hawking. Oh, Stephen Hawking. Yes, yes, he's a good friend of mine. Yeah. Yes, I mean, we were been in the same college for 50 years. I knew him very well. Yes, yes. Oh, well, yes, um, Stephen had a lot of uh, un unusual views and he loved publicity, it has to be said. I mean, sorry, I'm not, not denying him, extraordinarily clever man and all. Um, but um, I, he, he did 
say some fairly extreme things. Some of those uh, quotes I showed right back at the beginning uh, were uh, indeed from Stephen and, um, and other people who are quite clever, like Bill Gates, and less clever like Elon Musk. Um, but actually, uh, in his later life, Stephen was slightly more um, restrained. Uh, in particular, he had, uh, a few years before he died, a long conversation with um, Demis Hassabis, the man who set up the company DeepMind that's now owned by Google, which is probably the leading center for research in machine learning. Uh, and I, I, I think uh, um, Stephen was slightly more uh, uh, quiet in his views after that. So um, I, I, I think uh, essentially learning just this sort of thing, as Demis Sabis would say, that, that machine learning is a, a very powerful technique, <clears throat> but it's um, uh, it's not actually going to run out of control. Uh, I mean, the <clears throat> way that um, uh, Demetrius Sabis puts it is, is he is worried uh, about artificial intelligence, um, but he puts it at the same level as being worried about overpopulation on Mars. In other words, well, yes, it might be a problem, but it's not happening soon. Right. So thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I think it was a great answer. And I really love to talk. Thank you so much. Uh, sir, I, I have a question regarding uh, the robots. Uh, Mr. Elon Musk uh, uh, talks about the uh, AI and he wants about the impact of AI in, in the future. And in fact, quote unquote, in uh, one of his speeches, he said that robots will be able to do everything better than us. So in future, will ever humans will be facing something, uh, any sort of existential crisis because of these intelli intelligent machines? What's your view on that? Um, uh, well, it's very easy to say things like that. Um, uh, but do we actually think it's true? Uh, uh, and undoubtedly, for very specific purposes, um, we can make some progress. Uh, so uh, for very particular problems, uh, we can make machines that do them better than people. So um, uh, things like surgery, um, the robots are now steadier hands and uh, than, than humans uh, for manufacturing. They can manufacture cars repeatably uh, for, uh, and so on. So we, 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 can, we can do that for banking. We can have computer systems, well, <clears throat> that are uh, more accurate and handle more transactions than people writing with pens in giant ledgers. So yes, there are many things that uh, computers can do better than people. But to suggest that they can do everything um, uh, better and that they are um, uh, uh, somehow going to be able to do everything and differently, uh, it just doesn't work like that. That's, that, that, that's a, 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 a leap that's just not uh, there in practice. Uh, so there are some incredibly difficult problems that we can solve by computers, but to suggest that they can um generalize there's, there's simply no evidence to believe that it's happening it's just a, a new thing that um people who uh like to speculate and and worry us can speculate and worry us about thank you very much for, for your answer sir now we are going to take questions uh, uh, we have another question from sir sayyid ali Raza. Uh, sir your mic is uh, has been enabled uh, no, I don't have a question. Thank you. Oh, okay, okay. There, there is, uh, there are a few participants who are going to ask a question. Uh, now, uh, uh, roll number three, uh, three zero one. Please uh, ask the question. Your mic is going to be enabled. Your mic, in fact, has been enabled. You could ask a question. You know, sir. Hello. Yes. Uh, professor, I. Uh, 
where artificial intelligence is a rising technology and they will be or they will be or there are two type of people people who are who are encouraged by the artificial intelligence they are supporting artificial intelligence and they are trying to create it and there are uh, people like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking and other and other followers who don't believe in artificial intelligence and they are terrified by this as a student i would like to ask the question that which side we should choose we should be creating it we should be supporting it or we should be typing it and we should be uh, or we should be scanning from it <clears throat> uh, so sorry was the, the question was um, should we be uh, even looking at these problems uh, and the answer has to be yes um, there is no doubt that these sort of uh, as I say, I, I try to avoid the use of the words um, uh, artificial intelligence, but we think about ways that technology can be used. Um, so we think of the ways that it can be used to improve the lot of humans. Uh, and as I get older, my hearing goes. I'm very glad to have hearing aids and uh, maybe one day my heart will uh, become unreliable. I'll be very glad to have a pacemaker. Maybe I'll break a leg and be glad to have some prosthetics. So different bits of technology to help people are uh, undoubtedly a good thing. And um, uh, the, the sorts of technology that we're using uh, in manufacturing to, to make things, which mean that we're not having to have people doing dangerous um, or difficult jobs or we can simply do them better as we can in the case of surgery using machines is all a good thing so those are really excellent things to be working on um, and uh, what we we really have to remember is that um, uh, why are we doing this what's our motivation and are we good at it so if we're making a surgical robot we'd better be good at it um, and and so on so it, it is just uh, yes as computing professionals we're keen to to serve people we want to make better systems better technology that will help people um, and that's a a worthy and good thing to do and i'd encourage you to do it thank you professor for your elaborative answer uh, your your way of your way of teaching things is very good and i appreciate it thank you for your kind no, uh, okay, uh, uh, for the next question, uh, roll number 147, your mic has been enabled. You can ask your question. Uh, greetings, Professor. Hello. Uh, yes. I, yeah, I, I understand that we cannot yet simulate everything uh, that's human-like. And I think, if I'm not wrong, of course, uh, that this was elaborated well when we were discussing the, uh, you were discussing the crux of anthropomorphism uh, point in the psychological con uh, confusions part. However, I am curious, uh, there have been evidences of earlier biomorphic automata, in particular the very famous duck of uh, Vaconsin by Jack de Vaconsen, a French inventor, which serves as a good model for, uh, uh, for that, uh, which, uh, which was of course able to consume food and it was able to defecate. Uh, how far do you think uh, we're like, able to uh, realistically achieve that model in the modern day, such that uh, the machine uh, may feel hunger, so it may eat and it may defecate. And I think the, uh, we can make a case that the closest thing uh, that we have in the modern world, that is the example of fuel engines in automobiles. Uh, but I would love to know your take on this. Uh, well, that's a, uh, a, a, an amusing example, isn't it? Because these are um, a machines that they, show it processing but that's really no different from the robotic vacuum cleaner that goes around your house and when its battery is getting flat it goes and plugs itself in i mean the fact that this robot happens to consume uh, organic food and extract energy from it and um, uh, discards the waste isn't any different really from just a, uh, a robotic vacuum cleaner going and recharging its battery so it's great for getting publicity. And um, of course, uh, one of the things that I do know is that if you have a, 
uh, a humanoid robot, then yes, you're going to be very popular with the press. So uh, we produced a, ro a humanoid robot and we did dozens of television interviews because they all want to film it. And if you make a robot that you put organic food into it and it leaves organic waste, having extracted a rather inefficiently some energy from it, you're going to get publicity. But no one's pretending that it's in any sense a new life form. Uh, it's just a machine. Uh, I know we weren't pretending that this was a new life form. It was just a new machine. Okay, thank, okay, thank you all very much for, for, for the questions. Now I would like to uh, invite advisor GCUACM student chapter Sir Mohammad Afiz for his conclu uh, concluding remarks and thank our respected guest speaker. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much, Professor. First of all, I want to give you a few thoughts since I am teaching artificial intelligence right now. So this talk has made my job a little bit difficult and tricky <laughs> <laughs> because I'll be suspecting more technology and artificial intelligence and their future implications because artificial intelligence right now is standing on the talking of those big name and the small name we're talking about. Uh, the, the wording of them, the press releasing of them, the media of them, this is our publicity. So, but on the realistic ground, I am very much uh, happy to have you with us because you showed us a very realistic view of the world and the artificial intelligence and its application in the real life so that it can uh, help us humans to live better in this world and to make these machines more or less are, are more allies in a more friendly way, I would say. So thank you very much, Professor. And on the behalf of the Department of Computer Science, GCU University Lahore, Pakistan, and GCU ACM student chapter in particular, I'm really happy to have you with us. And I would like to have more sitting and more webinars, and if possible, the on-campus visit of you with us in future. Thank you very much to be with us. Thank you very much. And it's been a huge pleasure and really interesting questions. Thank you all very much indeed.